Well, this evening we are going to begin looking at the actual text of the Sermon on the Mount. And as most of you remember, the Sermon on the Mount begins with those series of teachings that Jesus made that we call the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes lay out for us personal character traits that a citizen of the kingdom must exhibit in their life now in order to be, uh, or in order to avoid the pronouncement of Jesus that he made in chapter 7, verses 21, 22, and 23. You cannot claim to be a Christian, a citizen of God's kingdom, and not live this way. For Jesus said, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many miracles? And yet Jesus says that he will turn to them and say, I never knew you. Depart from me. Now, those are some of the most scary words in Scripture but I can assure you there are going to be many, many people that we would say are religious, including pastors and supposed religious scholars that are going to hear those words from Jesus to their utter horror and surprise. Well, you might ask, how can that be? Why would that happen? because they failed to hear the words of Jesus in these Beatitudes with the ears of their hearts. They bought into human religion, religious teachings, traditions, and they practiced religion without the required relationship. And the king is going to say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. Remember last Sunday, we talked about the diversity of this audience that Jesus is preaching to. And part of that diversity came from the fact that there were the religious leaders from Jerusalem, way south in Palestine, who had come up to check out this guy Jesus, to take notes on what he said and what he was doing. Many of them will be some of the very first people to hear Jesus say, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, the Beatitudes do not necessarily teach us how to get into the kingdom of heaven. They teach us more how to live in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was teaching with the intent to lead the people to make a decision, to take action, to change the way they lived. That they were to live according to uh, kingdom principles, biblical principles. You see, the Jews to whom he was speaking thought that they were okay with God simply because they were Jews. They are God's chosen people and had been for thousands of years. And yet Jesus was teaching them that they had to make a choice. They had to make a decision. They had to change the way they were living in order to be citizens of the kingdom. Many of us, many churchgoers today, think that they are okay with God because of their church membership or their affiliation with a particular denomination. That they were baptized that they do good works, they serve in the church on a committee or sing in the choir, but they fail to realize that living in the kingdom, as Jesus presents it in these Beatitudes, requires character traits and a relationship with God based on what Jesus is teaching here, not human religion. Well, there are some features or observations I would like to share with you before we begin to read uh, the text itself. And the first is that you will notice as we read the Beatitudes that Jesus uses 
two very distinct verb tenses. For instance, the first beatitude said, Blessed are those that are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says in the next uh, beatitude, verse 4, Blessed are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus goes from the present tense to the future tense, and from verse 4 all the way down to verse 10, he uses the, first ten, uh, uh, the future tense, but then in verse 10 he reverts back to the present tense. And again in verse 12, he uses the present tense, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Well, why is that? Why is that even important? Is this another illustration of Carrie's clock, context, background? No, not at all. There, it is illustrating an incredibly important principle about the kingdom of heaven that we need to understand because it affects this sermon and it affects all the teachings in the New Testament. And that is that there is a present reality about the kingdom of God. It is present now here. But there's also a future reality of the kingdom of God. Those that live according to kingdom principles now in their lives demonstrate these character qualities, these traits, realize the blessings of the kingdom to the extent that the kingdom is here. Because we still have sinful, broken natures. And we live in a sinful, broken, fallen world. But there is also a future reality. When the kingdom will be here in its fullness, we say. Its culmination. But that's not going to happen until Jesus is here in person. He comes the second time. And he will rule the earth in person then his kingdom will be here in its fullness. You remember that Jesus uses the language of that, that the kingdom of heaven is near. He doesn't say it's here until he has been crucified, buried, and resurrected. When Jesus begins his public ministry, and certainly now as he's teaching this Sermon on the Mount, he admonishes his audience, who is Jewish, to keep the law, the law the way God gave it to Moses, not the way the law had been presented to them by their religious leaders, but nonetheless the law. The new covenant didn't come until he was crucified and resurrected. So we're in that very pivotal transitional period of time in all of human history that we spoke about last week. The kingdom of God is here or near and then here after his death, burial, and resurrected, but it won't be here in its fullness until he comes the second time. This is called the already-not-yet tension. It's a duality. Both are real and both are true. Jesus comes to introduce the kingdom, to understand and teach the kingdom uh, teachings or principles, how to live in the kingdom, but it's not here in its fullness until he comes a second time. Now, as I said, this already not yet duality or tension affects everything we hear and learn in the New Testament because all of the New Testament writers write with the expectation of the eventual coming of Jesus the second time. And so we understand both the Sermon on the Mount and all the teachings of the New Testament writers, their exhortations to us to live righteously before God, to reflect well on the kingdom, to uh, how we invest our time, our money, and our resources. Jesus calls it storing up treasures in heaven, sort of like your T. Rowe Price or your Fidelity account in heaven, your retirement account. Because there's a future expectation of when that kingdom and those, those treasures, Jesus says he's going to bring them with him when he comes the second time. Jesus is introducing this duality, this truth, 
now in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's saying that everything in life, we have this awareness of this already, live in the reality of the present kingdom, but not yet. It hasn't come in its fullness, and it will. And so everything we do in this reality, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, our resources, what we, we're investing in when the kingdom comes in its fullness. Well, not only is that important because we're going to celebrate and be so joyful when Jesus comes, but there's the element of accountability. Jesus is going to hold us accountable for what we did with those blessings that he gave us in the present kingdom. How did we use them to build his kingdom? That's why he said, store up treasures in heaven. We store up treasures in heaven when we do something to move his kingdom forward and to expand his kingdom by including others who are not part of his kingdom, but encourage them to make a decision to come into his kingdom. Well, the second observation I would uh, draw your attention to is that each of the Beatitudes can stand alone in and of themselves, on their own. But they are also very related. And as we go through them, I will point out to you how when you do one Beatitude and you get that down, then it helps you do the next and then the next and then the next. They're interrelated. The third observation is the fact that we all are familiar with the Beatitudes and their use of the word blessed. And for years I have taught that on the surface the word blessed means happy or be, uh, to be congratulated. And that is not incorrect. But in doing some additional study, and especially with the word blessed and its a root meaning in the ancient languages, we find that there are two words that stand behind that word blessed. And those two words have the same root word, which means approval. Humans bless God when we worship and when we live righteously according to kingdom principles before him. And God in his grace blesses those humans who live that way with his approval. It does not mean we're perfect. It does not mean that life is perfectly, uh, circumstances are fine. God approves of us because of the status of our relationship with him and the intent of our heart and that we are living righteously in this fallen, broken world. One who is blessed is one who is approved of God because of his relationship his or her relationship with God, and their righteous behavior, conduct, before God. When we consciously and intentionally and consistently live righteously before God, the Bible says we are blessed. Being approved of God doesn't mean that life is going to be smooth or that we will never make a mistake. God understands our humanity. But God understands the intent of our heart. And that's what he says. Remember in the Sermon on Mount, he says, we look on the outside. God looks at the heart. Well, the last thing I want you to see about these Beatitudes is that they are divided into two groups. The first four, verses uh, three through six, speak about our relationship to God. Our vertical relationship between us as an individual and our Heavenly Father. The second group of Beatitudes, which begin with verse 7 and go all the way to verse 12, they speak about our relationship with others. Other people. That's our horizontal relationship. And the verses 13 through 16, Jesus shows us the result of living that way. The fruit, if you will. First related to God accurately or properly, and then related to each other accurately and properly, appropriately. It allows us then, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, to live in a way that reflects well on the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And you will remember that's where this whole sermon series came from. For several weeks, we've been looking at tools for your toolbox, how God gives us resources to live lives worthy of him and to reflect well on his kingdom. 
Well, now we're looking to the teachings of the king himself on how to live well in his kingdom and reflect well. Well, let's look at the uh, Beatitudes and begin our reading in chapter 5 of verse, uh, excuse me, of Matthew. Um, well, we're v- verse 3, the first Beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, being poor of spirit has been interpreted in a host of um, ways. But in actuality, it is our starting point in our relationship with God. Being poor of spirit means to be lowly of heart. Our self-evaluation, our humility, our contriteness. We have a right evaluation of ourselves before God. The person who is poor of spirit acknowledges and confesses his or her utter spiritual bankruptcy before God. Anyone who is poor of spirit cannot be arrogant and self-righteous. They recognize their need for God's mercy and grace and forgiveness. They don't come to God on their own merit or in their own merit. They come crying out for mercy and for forgiveness. The psalmist puts it this way in Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. For if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness, and therefore, you are feared. In biblical language, that word depths speaks of being in the pit. You can't go any lower. You've hit rock bottom. But the psalmist is crying from that position, that self-evaluation of his life at any one point. And he's crying for God to hear him and show him mercy. He's crying out for forgiveness. But he does it with confidence. Did you note that? For with you there is forgiveness. Because he knows God's love for him and God's nature and his willingness to forgive. Well, you know, if you stop and you think about that for a moment, you realize that this is Old Testament poetry, Hebrew poetry. How much more is God willing to forgive us who live in the age of grace? Because Jesus has paid for every one of our sins. We don't have to do animal sacrifices to cover our sins. When we confess our sins, the Bible says God erases them. He forgets them and remembers them no more. Well, there's a second aspect to this poor of spirit, and it comes in verse 4. And this shows us the relatedness of these two Beatitudes, or the Beatitudes in general. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Mourning is akin to having a poor or to being poor of spirit. Because when you are poor of spirit, as we just said, you see yourself correctly in your relationship to a holy and righteous and perfect God. And we stand as a fallen, broken sinner before a holy, righteous God. And attached to our cry for mercy and forgiveness is a cry or a reality uh, an acknowledgement of uh, mourning. We mourn over our sinfulness. We mourn that we are not able to meet God's standard, that we fail him on a daily basis because we still sin. And it calls us or causes us to cry out. When we express our poorness of spirit, 
and we mourn because of our sinful state, we stand correctly evaluating ourselves accurately before a holy, righteous God. And then God will respond in his love and his grace and mercy with forgiveness. And he says, theirs is the kingdom of God, present reality. And they will be comforted both now in this life and in the life to come in eternity because they saw themselves rightly before God and asked for his forgiveness. Now, meekness in verse 5 is a little bit more difficult to define, but it does not mean weakness. Meekness is a confident, settled uh, gentleness that is couched in humility and contriteness before God. It allows those who develop this character quality or this character trait to relate to others with gentleness and kindness because they recognize their own sinfulness. There's no one-upmanship, no superior, no eliteness before God. We're all sinners before God in the need of his mercy and his grace and forgiveness. Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth. That is that they will rule with Jesus when his kingdom comes in its fullness, but they're not going to rule the way people rule now, with arrogance and power. They're going to rule with meekness, a gentleness that is born out of a relationship with God that gives one confidence and strength because they're rooted in God. Verse 6 gives us the next beatitude. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. What do you hunger and thirst for? If any of you are uh, addicted, as I once was, to coffee, you understand what it means to hunger and thirst for coffee. When that alarm goes off in the morning, it would be best if there was a hot cup of coffee sitting there on the nightstand with a little half and half and sweet and low, because you hunger and thirst for that warm drink, even when it's 75 and 80 degrees, it's six in the morning. <laughs> My wife hungers and thirsts for a soda pop. She's addicted to a drink called Sundrop. Diet Sundrop to be sure, but it still has caffeine. And woe be unto me if there is not a chilled can of sundrop in the refrigerator when she comes out of the bedroom and into the kitchen to start the day. Jesus is picturing here a person who is living according to kingdom principles, doing the will of God, living righteously, out of a sincere heart in response to that love and mercy and grace and forgiveness that he has received through his relationship with God. Because he has that, the result is that there's this, this inner drive, this hunger and thirst to live honorably before God because he recognizes what he's received from God. He understands who he is before God and who he is now because he has received God's approval. He is blessed. He's forgiven. And that's what we're all about in this series, living righteously before God. We want to be prepared for the fullness of his kingdom, which is coming. We want to be faithful stewards of the blessings that he's given us now in the present reality of the kingdom in anticipation of the fullness of his kingdom. And what a testimony it is to the world around us of what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, the family of God. Well, next Sunday, we will look at the Beatitudes that relate to our horizontal relationships how we relate to others
because we are rightly related to God and we are walking righteously before him. Let's pray.